this is, this is, this is. Hey, you guys, welcome to episode number 383 of the Mike Herrera podcast. Great to be here. Great to be uh, talking with you guys. I got voicemails for you this week. Voicemails, your voicemails. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, MXPX.com, we have uh, a new t-shirt design up right now for Halloween. I don't know if you guys got your costumes ready to go. Maybe I'll talk about that in a second. But we have a new t-shirt design called, uh, well, it's the MXPX Bones Brigade. Uh, inspired definitely by the Bones Brigade, also by our self-titled artwork. Um, a little mix on that. MXPX.com, everything you guys do, going there, listening to the music, buying a t-shirt or a sticker or whatever it is from the merch arsenal. That helps us keep going, helps us keep being creative. And uh, a lot of people have been asking, you know, are we ever gonna do a live stream again? And we uh, we are, we're gonna do a live stream. I would say we'd do at least one by the end of the year. We'll see what happens. Um, but yes, that's not going away. Check out um, the podcast 381 uh, just a couple ago. And we talk all about the future of MXPX, what we're planning, what we're in the middle of so uh, I won't get into it too much on this episode. Maybe I will, I don't know, we'll see what your questions are, but um, that's a great episode as a, as a resource to find out what MXPX is up to. 381's the, the episode with uh, Tom Chinchilla. Uh, okay, let's get to, let's get to the, the confession. Um, I have a confession to make, and that is I'm a terrible, terrible cleaner. I can clean. I'm just not going to do the best job. I'm not going to be the best person. I, I remember when I was, uh, <laughs> I had a, I was working like odd jobs back in the day. This was when I was a kid, probably in high school. <clears throat> and it was, uh, it was before, maybe it was even junior high because it was before I worked at Spiro's, which was really kind of my first like tax paying job where I paid into it. Um, but all the other jobs were just odd jobs. Like I did landscaping for a while, that was my first job, but uh, I did these odd jobs working for this doctor and he, he had a mustache and curly hair and a very important doctor and his, his house was super fancy, like kind of like, like if you were super rich in the 80s and you built a house, that, that's this house. It's like all the angles were weird, it was carpeted everywhere. Um, there were, in the kitchen there was I want to say, I don't think there was carpet in the kitchen actually, but there was these um, receptacles in the hallway, in the kitchen, in the living room, and you would plug in a vacuum and you'd be able to vacuum everywhere in the house plugged into the wall and all of the material, you know, would go down into this, this bin. Just like wow! After a while, wouldn't that get, wouldn't that get weird? Uh, but anyway, it was just it was set up very modern at the time. But uh, I would do like leaf blowing. I would just do like random stuff outside. And one day he had me, he had me uh, paint this lattice. A lattice is this like crisscrossed wooden fence that you can have like plants. Usually you have a lattice. Uh, in front of a, a, a taller porch, like a, a porch steps that come up and you, you have a lattice that, that will make it look nicer. Anyway, Google what a lattice is, you'll figure it out. I had to paint one of those. He's like, paint this, you know, da, da, da. I'm like, okay. Well, what I didn't realize is I wasn't a painter. Like I don't, I was a kid just doing whatever was asked of me and I would do it or try to do it. and this lattice i was painting this lattice and it was just like slopping on the paint and the paint wouldn't go on smoothly because of all the crisscross of the wood you know going back and forth and you're just like so i'm just like ch -ch 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 -ch, and, and just slopping this paint on this lattice and i'm like okay i think i'm done like i knew in my mind oh, this is shitty this is terrible <laughs> this is so terrible and i show the guy you know, he comes back from whatever he's doing. I, I, I would usually work on the weekends or uh, sometimes he would be there, sometimes he'd be gone. He'd leave me a note or something like that of what to do. But um, my mom was was actually like her, his housekeeper at the time. My mom used to ha clean houses. It's all coming back to me uh, a little bit. I, I wasn't planning on even telling this story. This is how I do these voicemail podcasts, I just go. But uh, 
so my mom was the housekeeper. That's why I know all about the vacuum system. And she was like showing me and I'm watching her doing the vacuum. But I would go out and do jobs and, and get paid. Anyway, so back to the lattice. I'm like, I'm done with the lattice. And I show it to him and he's like, this is terrible. This looks, this isn't done. Go back and make it look nice, make it look good. And, and I remember him being pretty mad. Like, I don't remember what he said at all. I'm just par paraphrasing, but he didn't swear at me. He didn't, he didn't call me an asshole or a dumb shit. He just, he just was mad and was like, go back and, f you know, finish that, man. I don't pay you to do crap work or whatever. And so I went back and I, at that point, I guess I took a rag and I started trying to wipe all the drips off of it. And actually that made a huge difference. And, and I figured it out, you know, and I didn't have, it's not like somebody's telling me, okay, this is how you paint a lattice. Um, and, you know, I failed, I, I failed miserably and got yelled at for it. Although, you know, I have a visceral memory of it, but I don't remember what he said. I just remember him being so mad and I, I was feeling so bad, like, cause I knew I didn't do a good job, <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I failed and I, I got it to where it was reasonably okay. Like I wouldn't say that it was was up to my standards right now. Like like if I did that at home, again, I'm not the best person to do. You know, I do odd jobs all the time around home, but I'm not the best at it. So back to cleaning, um, cleaning day is once a week and we basically it's, I mean, it's my wife. She does she does everything. But I wanted to help. I'm like, what can I do? And she's like, you can vacuum. Um, and then she ends up usually vacuuming a bunch of things before I, I even start. <laughs> so I don't have to do as much. But uh, I get up in the morning and pretty much the first thing I do after I say hi and hug all the kids is I just start vacuuming. I, I vacuum from the dining room all the way through the living room. It's kind of an open floor, dining room, living room, kind of kind of open floor. It's not really, actually it's not technically, uh, but it is a circular thing. So I go around and I go to the front and then I'm in the foyer, which is like the locker room because we have some like lockers in, in the lobby of our house. It's like a tiny little room that there's nothing we can do with. So it's a lobby, right? It's a foyer. But I hate saying that word foyer. Actually, I kind of like saying that word foyer. It's kind of nice, foyer. It doesn't really mean much, but it's like the entrance of a house. Uh, anyway, we call it the locker room. I vacuum that, I vacuum, I wonder if I'm supposed to vacuum my bathroom. I think I am, and I think I missed that today. <sighs> I'm usually pretty good at it, so, and I go upstairs, so I start vacuuming upstairs. Note to self, now I just remembered, my wife told me she vacuumed the locker room and probably the bathroom as well. She was like, don't worry about that. Just go upstairs, you know. So I went, I did all the stairs. I do the hallway upstairs. I do our bedroom. I do both kids' rooms and the bathroom up there. So um, that's my job, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, aside from that, you know, I, I've talked about this on the podcast in the past, but over the summer, you know, we I really took – landscaping seriously you know i had back in the day when we first started started living where we live now we always had somebody doing the landscaping it was a big it's a big yard it's a lot going on and i was touring all the time i wasn't really around much during the summer so we had we had a you know a company come and do it but you know over the pandemic everything's really changed you know we don't work with a lot of the same people and uh i just started doing it myself my dad was helping me I'd pay him like 20 bucks to mow my lawn. And finally he just stopped coming over and he just stopped asking. And I was like, maybe he doesn't want to do that anymore. Maybe my money's not quite good enough. It was like 25 bucks. It wasn't 20 bucks. It was like 25 bucks or something like that. And I'm just like, all right, if I was him, I wouldn't want to do it either. You know, he has to mow his lawn. He mows a bunch of other lawns. He, he I think he mows my sister's lawn. So I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So I, I started mowing the lawn myself, and, and, you know, I don't always do the best job, or you know, I'll do it in sections where I'll mow the front, front yard one, one day, and then like the next day I'll mow 
you know, down below or whatever. But it's like, I just, I can get it done. And, and we're one, we're saving money, but also the feeling, you know, I feel, I feel like I have a little better understanding of what's going on at my house when I do little odd jobs here and there. Um, and, and I think landscaping is just one of those pieces of the puzzle is, you know, taking pride in, in your homestead and your living arrangement. I, I, you know, to me, it doesn't matter how big or how small my, my living arrangement is. It's about, is it comfortable? Is it, does it look nice? And like I said, I'm not the best at cleaning and I will live in filth. I mean, we can talk about the studio next, but at home, because we, I have a family and you know, it's, I live with a woman. She's, she's gotta have things clean. And I enjoy that. I really like that. And, and you know, you don't always have, have the time to keep things clean, especially if you're on your own, maybe you're a single parent is it's near to impossible to do it all, to do it all. So some, some things get, swept under the rug, right? So, <laughs> and that's all right. But uh, I really enjoy just having uh, having a, a space. So no matter how big or small, like when I was touring all the time, we'd always have our bunks, right? In, in our bus and we'd go in and, and I was usually in the back, middle, bottom, somewhere in that section. And, and you know, different, some in the US we'd have bunks, we'd have um, big bunks, we'd, uh, I can't remember what we'd call them. What we call those things? Um, we'd call them like studio apartments. You know, like here's my studio apartment. But, but basically, when you have a three bunk space in a bus, and then you take out one of those bunks and you move down the top bunk to the middle, and you've got two big apartments. We call them big apartments rather than like small apartments. So, um, star, you know. St you know, and then if you ha if you're in the back of the bunk, or sorry, back of the bus, the back lounge, that's like a bedroom back there. Sometimes it's just like a living room with a TV and people hang out, and then other times it's like a bedroom, and you call that the star star room or star cabin or <laughs> stabbing cabin. Uh, but if there's a bed back there, that's usually for like, you know, Johnny Cash sleeps back there. Um, so we actually did have Johnny Cash's like guitar players bus, his first bus back in the day. Uh, at, at a point, but um, I digress. Back to the apartments in the bus. Just having a space for yourself, whether it was one of one of those small bunks, I'd usually be on the bottom or the middle, and I've been on the top before on a, on a on a three bunker as well. Um, they can be tight, you know. The top the top usually has like something coming down, so it's like a little less space, but the bottom can be a little tight too. Uh, it just depends. You can, people that are claustrophobic right now are like, Rrr. but usually, unless you're super tall, um, you've got you've got about I don't know a, a foot or two extra space at the bottom of the bunk, and you can throw like your bag down there. I, I you know put personal like other clothing. You throw clothing down there. A lot of times we'd have like a, a rack or like a net on the side. Uh, and you put your cell phone in there. You could put your cell phone like in the crack of your 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 uh, mattress. But anyway, I, I would just set it up. Everybody would kind of set it up how they liked and would had you know, have a charger in there for your phone. Um, but uh, you know, just getting comfortable. You know, no matter what the space is, and and I think the smaller the space, the easier it is to maintain. You know, and that's you know a lot of my friends. K.W. Miller. He used to. He's playing the Rocky Point All Stars back here in, in Bremerton, but he uh, he played with Tumble Down back when we first started. He was kind of sitting in with us, and he he kind of like was uh, was in on the beginning. But anyway, that's K. W. Miller. But he is a good example of somebody that has like a real small space. Like I went and visited him when he would move to West Virginia, and there's a video on this actually, mm. probably on my YouTube from years and years ago. But uh, I was on tour with uh, Louis D. Fabrizio doing a solo tour back in the uh, no man land days of the music business. And um, I stopped by and I just loved his, his little music room. It was like his garage workshop slash music room and it was set up so nicely. And you know, he didn't have a ton of stuff, but everything he had had a purpose and everything had a spot and a place on the wall. And uh, and a little thumb 
little thumb piano. What do you call that? Thumb piano? Do 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 thumb. Fl- yeah, I don't know what you call those, but <laughs> yeah. So my whole point is having a a place to clean um, and take pride in is is nice. So it's something to work towards if you don't have it yet. Something to take care of and take note of if you do have it, and maybe you're not. You're not really taking the time. I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not the person that you should take advice from, like I said, about cleaning because I don't clean well and I don't clean often. But when forced to, I do it and I enjoy it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like it's like it's the same thing as like exercising. Like I hate exercising or I loved exercising for a while, but now I'm kind of hating it. Uh, <laughs> but when I do it and when I'm done doing it, I always feel good. Uh, whenever I sit down and write a song, it's sometimes it's hard or you'd rather just zone out and not think about things but but at the same time once you're done with that song or when you're in the moment of doing it it's it's so much fun and it's so fulfilling and, and rewarding all of those things are true about about cleaning um about organizing about all of that and here in the studio i'll bring it bring it home here um <clears throat> i've had uh so many years and so many different setups and the one thing that I've always loved is having a clean studio. And it's not always clean. It's a mess most of the time. Right now, it's a mess. Um, but now and again, I'll, I'll go through or I'll have Greg come over. Greg's my, one of my buddies. He's really great at organizing. Him and I will just go to town and I can let him just do his thing. You know how you can have some people that'll help you with something, but when they're done doing whatever it is you ask them to do, they stand there and they're waiting for the next thing. Greg is not like that. Greg will find something. He'll look around and he'll find something. And if it's drastic, he'll ask me and be like, hey, do you think I should do this? I'm like, yeah. Or, ah, eh, nah, don't worry about it. But I love that he's proactive and he can just do things on his own. And, and we come in here and, and just go to town and organize. And uh, we have, a, we have a, a string closet. It's all our Ernie Ball strings and you know, bass strings, guitar strings, acoustic. Uh, we have mandolin strings in there. It, you know, it's, it's all over the place. And then we have cables and, and all of our sort of electric equipment and, and things that are um, accessories to that. So cables, batteries, string winders. Um, that that greg helped me organize and he did a great job and it's like you open the closet and it's like brrr, strings everywhere kind of like our beer fridge which is another thing that's fun to organize uh when we do live streams uh speaking of live streams again uh you know we go into the kitchen open up the fridge and there's just a row not a row it's a wall of beers all color coordinated looking nice and it's like that to me makes my heart happy and uh part of that is probably because i'm somewhat domesticated over the years uh (laughs) having a family and all that but i love i love uh i love organized i don't love organizing Uh, i don't mind organizing now and again but i love having things organized if that that that's the clarification so um yeah and just the other day had to clean the, the toilet you know and so i'm in there in the in the studio bathroom just scrubbing the toilet going like this is yuri this is tom this is chris this is anybody else trey's been in here You're like you know this is me mostly because i'm in here most of the time this is rick <laughs> this is this is probably charlie if you if you listen to our last week's episode uh <laughs> talking to aj perdomo about all these ghost things here um something happened you know something weird ha- I, I don't want to go into it but maybe i'll go into it again on another episode i'll go into some more ghost stuff because i feel like more things are starting to happen but i don't want to go into it right now i want to get to your voicemails so let's get to these voicemails i have not listened to these uh we'll do three four or five at the most um and then uh you guys have a great week so let's do it hey mike been a fan for over 23 years grew up in a little dive town that I know you remember called Thunder Bay, Ontario, and Mm -hmm. never have had the chance to see you now live on the West Coast, I-5 corridor, a couple hours from you, so the odds are up 
maybe one of these days I'll get to live out my lifelong dream of seeing you guys live, but we'll see. Two questions. Uh, on your left arm, you have a circle tattoo. I don't know what it is. Spent many hours freezing my tail off in the north, counting my loonies, wondering what in the world that tattoo is. It looks cool. Just could never figure out what that circle on your forearm is. Second question. All right, I'm going to pause there. Might as well answer this. Thanks for calling from Thunder Bay. Yes, we played Thunder Bay. It's a, it's a way up there, cold, froze our pants off. Mm. I think it was Thunder Bay. We were on tour. Uh, it was us headlining, I think, Re Reset, who who became later became Simple Plan, but Reset was touring with us and, and supporting. And we ran across this parking lot from our bus to a mini well, I guess it's just bowling. They call it bowling in Canada. But all the pins are tiny. Everything's small. But I just remember how cold it was. It literally hurt to to just go across this long, huge parking lot to get to this place. By the time we got in, there were popsicles. So anyway, uh, Thunder Bay, great time. Uh, this is going to be easy. Uh, that tattoo is a Northwest, a native Northwest Indian artwork and it's a raven so it's a raven with a berry in its mouth and so it looks like a totem a totem pole excuse me i'm uh burping excuse me it looks like a totem pole and and uh it's a northwest indian native american art so uh i don't know anything more about it but there is something really really uh interesting i got this early on i got it in bremerton washington at tattoo technique um by the same guy that did my first tattoo which was the poconacha punk on my on my right arm and i went back and got this done uh by the same dude and he um i just picked it out of a book i just looked i looked you know, through the tattoo designs and I picked it out of a book and I thought it was cool. I, I, I was really into seaweed at the time probably and seaweed, the band, and they had some like Northwest American artwork on some cover of their album or something like that. And I just, I don't know. I just liked the artwork. It wasn't the same. It was like a different thing, but, um, I just picked it and I got it. But uh, the, the weird and interesting fun fact about my tattoo, my Northwest Native American tattoo, is Stephen Edgerton of The Descendants and all. Good friend of mine. And we, we didn't know each other at the time, but we both have the same tattoo. And his tattoo is not quite as good as mine, like quality-wise, my opinion, but it's on his upper arm. So, um, but when we met each other and started hanging out with each other, we noticed we have the same tattoo. It's so crazy. Like how, what are the odds? Like, it's not like it's black flag bars or something, which I also have right here. Uh, but yeah, super, super strange fun fact about my, uh, my, one of my first couple tattoos. I mean, it was like second or third tattoo I ever got. All right, what's the next question you had? And last question. 99, uh, I spent some more of those loonies to join the MXPX fan club. Uh, is the stuff, I, is it still in the mail? Probably. I, it never came, but that's okay. Um, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's just about here. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for your music. And thanks for uh, letting me borrow some of your songs to impress the woman that became my wife. That I've now been married to you for 17 years. Rock on, buddy. Love you. Right on. <laughs> Congratulations on 17 years. And uh, all I can say about that is uh, it's probably in the mail. So you need to, at the time, everything was different. Um, we didn't do the fan club in house, I don't think, in 1999. Um, so that must have been Fanscape, uh, a company that was really started through MXPX, but but not our company. Um, Larry Weintraub uh, from A&M, who signed us to A&M, later started that company with a, a partner or two. And 
they were great, honestly. And, and I'm, I'm sure a few things got missed though. So uh, back then, you know, it was not easy just to email somebody or call somebody, you know, you didn't know what to do if you never got your, your package. So um, why don't you send me uh, an email or send, yeah, send me an email. Um, go to, what is the email for MXPX, the store? MXPX at stores, no, stores at MXPX.com. Email us um, and uh, yeah, I'll look it up and we'll get you a new package. How about that? We'll make it happen. Thunder Bay, Ontario. Now, <laughs> I'm sure other people are like, dang, I should have done that too. I should have called in and asked for something. But, you know, it, it's, it's easy enough. He paid already. He never got his package. It's only the right thing to do. Uh, we will make it right. Um, let us know your shirt size and uh, your address, all that. Stores at mxpx.com. And, and just to make sure, why don't you go to mxpx.com and scroll down to contact us and just make sure that it's the correct, the correct email. But I think that's the email. All right. Thanks for calling and good times. Let's get to the next one. Dude, Mike, this is insane. Um, been a fan a long time. I'm talking 96, dude. Amazing music, amazing band, amazing people. Thank you. Um, my question was, have you guys ever had to use the do you know who I am card? <laughs> My number is 360-773-8276. Why don't you leave me a voicemail later, bud? All right. I have not used that too often, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've been accused of doing that. I, I was accused, um, this was years ago, I was accused of going, walking up to a local show here in Bremerton and demanding to get in for free. And when I wasn't let in for free, I said, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? And I absolutely have never done that. I would never do that, especially at a local show, but I would never do that at any show or anywhere for that matter, because I don't walk around thinking everybody knows who I am. So in fact, uh, I'm surprised sometimes when people know who I am, <laughs> you know, <laughs> good times. All right. Uh, I'm probably not going to get back to calling you back, sir, but thanks for your message. Um, it served, it served this podcast. Well, here we go. Hey Mike, this is Matt Sullivan from the band title holder. Title uh, holder. I have a question about you starting working with Goldfinger. I'm sure you probably addressed this before, but what was that experience like? How did it come to be? Um, what's your relationship before being asked to play bass in Goldfinger with John Feldman? Uh, huge fan of everything you do. Keep it up. Thanks. Hey, hey. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, title holder. Cool, cool. Goldfinger was... Uh, was <clears throat> out of the blue, to be honest. It was out of the blue, wasn't expecting uh, to ever join Goldfinger. I w became a fan of Goldfinger when Here in Your Bedroom was on MTV. And, you know, anytime I, I didn't have MT MTV growing up, but later on in life, of course, I got to see plenty of it. And this was kind of that, because, I mean, we were already a band. I think MX Peaks was going. They, you know, Goldfinger as a band started, I think one year later, I think they started in 1993 and MXP started in 1992. Could be wrong, but I'm thinking I'm fairly close on that. I mean, so they, you know, but they were in where, where MXPX didn't have a lot of experience when we started, we started just as little kids and this was our first band and these are our first songs and this is our first time doing anything and playing live. Goldfinger and John, John Feldman, he started out years ago playing in a bunch of different bands. Um, the, what is it, the Galactic Love Hogs or something? I'm, I'm screwing that up a little bit. John's been on my podcast. He talks about his first couple bands and all that. But, you know, all those players in Goldfinger had been playing in bands before Goldfinger. And so Goldfinger started, they were already adults. Um, they were 
very experienced and John was a great songwriter already. Um, Charlie, you know, Paulson was a great guitar player already, but where MXPX was just like literally just figuring it out, just starting, how do we do this? You know, so I don't know why I mentioned that. It's kind of just an interesting, interesting fact that uh, we started before them, but it was our first band rather than our like seventh band or whatever it is, or maybe, maybe fourth band for John or something. I don't know how many bands he was in, but uh so i had met them though we 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 played mxpx open for the sex pistols um in 1997 and it was a bumper shoot set so we were playing bumper shoot uh on our own different stage and they were playing the main stage and our stage by the way was pretty big it was us and sicko it was a great 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 situation loved it loved sicko uh and by the way, if you guys love pop punk and you haven't heard of Sicko, check out their their stuff. It's early 90s, kind of, they're way before their time. Uh, their sound is so perfect, I guess. I don't know, I like it. Anyway, um, so we were playing Bumper Shoot in Seattle, Washington, and, and Sex Pistols were on a tour. And so just by default, Goldfinger was on their tour and they were playing Bumper Shoot as well. And stabbing westward was main support and their singer got sick something happened couldn't make the show and so they moved goldfinger up and they needed an opening slot for the show and we had just finished our set we literally played our set and we were asked by like one of the you know one of the stu uh, one of the bumper shoot people hey uh we need somebody to open for the sex pistol show would you guys be into doing it and we're like uh what are you kidding me yeah so we hump all our gear from one stage to over to the other one and and load in and set up and we do our thing you know the funny thing is is playing that sex pistol show uh we we uh you know we had just played a full set you know this bit and it was a big crowd it was a full full place you know it was awesome and so it was sweaty and we were just out of it and so when when we played our our opening set playing -na 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 -na, whatever we we get to punk rock show because my strings had been played so much and back in those days i didn't have a string deal with ernie ball i was just using i was just buying strings or whatever and so i didn't and they were expensive back then too much more expensive than they are today i think they're like 40 bucks a pop so i wasn't changing my strings too often and punk rock show we're playing our last song and my string breaks the top string i'm like oh my this is like the most important string and i'm like starting to miss things i keep playing guess what happens my a string breaks and it's just like it's like a, a you know when you see pictures like of a, a walking bridge go out and all the people fall you know that's what i felt like i'm just like my whole world is crashing. Like, what is happening? <laughs> We're opening for the Sex Pistols. There's all these people that are seeing us for the first time that have heard the name Emmings Peaks because we had radio play, all this thing, you know. Anyway, uh, it was chaos. And, and I'm sure I remembered it much worse than it was because, I mean, Yuri was still playing drums and I was still singing and the guitars were still going. So it wasn't that big of a deal. But that really left a mark on me psychologically. Like I was scarred for a while, just like, uh. So we met Goldfinger that day. Darren was crazy, you know, on drums. And, um, you know, we, we ha I've had Darren on the podcast. So Darren Pfeiffer, check out his episode on the podcast. He's probably been on a couple of times, but uh, on my podcast, he, he talks about that day. We talk about that day and his perspective is so great because he remembers a lot. He remembers everything. and. I won't get into it here, but um, they trashed they trashed the, the dressing room that day. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Goldfinger, getting getting on to how I joined Goldfinger, I didn't see those guys that much. Every now and again, I'd see them like, I saw them at Soundwave over in Australia, you know, when MXPX was playing with the Ataris, and um, that was when I was actually, I played with the Ataris. Um, so I think John saw me playing bass for the Ataris, I played for one tour. I, I played uh, bass for the Ataris, and then uh, Chris Rowe played guitar for MXPX as a fill-in. Uh, it was for 
the MX Peaks All Stars in those days. So around 2000, 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just, I don't know if that's how I, I should ask John, but I don't know how he thought of me again, but about 2013, 2012, 2013, he calls me and he's like, Hey, just out of the blue, like, Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm like, I mean, he's never really called me before, so, um, okay, you know, uh, he's like, we're going to Australia, and I need a bass player, da, 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 da. I'm like, hmm, all right, let me, let me check, and see, see if I can do it, da, 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 da. and, you know, I got their, their manager, Stephanie, at the time, their manager, Stephanie, you know, got a hold of me, and was giving me, you know, more details, and uh, basically my first tour with them was in Australia 2013 and it was Real Big Fish, Goldfinger, Zebra Head and I think that's it. I think that those those are the bands and I had a blast. I mean it was just a lot of fun um, getting to just hang out in a different environment than what I was used to, you know, with MXPX. So, and what I was used to even just by myself, it was, it was more akin to like when I do solo tours where I'm more on my own, but I'm also with the, all these other people. So Aaron Barrett from Real Big Fish on that tour played guitar uh, for Goldfinger, you know? So like we've had a lot of fill-ins over the years and, uh, and it's been awesome because I've been able to like hang out with this guy, hang out with this guy, you know, and get to know people that I knew before, but just hadn't spent as much time with before. I think that's been huge with, with uh, being in Goldfinger because there are so many different people coming in and out. MXPX, it's always the same guys for the most part. So uh, our crew changes here and there, but um, yeah, so back to Goldfinger. So I do that first tour in Australia and I think that's, I'm thinking that's probably it, you know, we're, I'll just do that or whatever, you know, and, and see what happens. But um, he calls me up again and he's like, we're doing some East Coast dates. Now Charlie and Darren are back in the band. So here, here's something. Charlie and Darren were not on that Australia tour. They didn't want to go. I mean, there, there's band politics. Let's just face it. There was, there was some disagreements within the band uh, where, you know, Charlie was out for a while and <laughs> Darren was out. But Darren came back. Charlie came back and I get a call. John's like, hey, we're doing some dates up in the East Coast. We're doing, you know, New York and up there. And then we're doing, we're doing going down to Florida, doing some dates down there. And uh, so I got on a plane and I flew over and I did, I did, um, I did some rehearsals and I, I went and toured with, with the original lineup, except for me, you know, being the bass player. So I had known like, Kelly, Kelly Lemieux, who's not the original bass player, but he's the, the only other bass player that I've actually met. I haven't met Simon uh, before, but um, I've heard he's a lovely guy. But uh, yeah, so I knew, I knew Kelly, but Kelly was, it was and is now in um, Chuck, uh, Buck Cherry, Chuck Berry, Buck Cherry as their bass player. And so he was just full-time gigging that. And um, now and again, he'll come back and do and do do stuff with Goldfinger, but uh, let me let me rewind. So so at the time, you know, I was with all the the original guys, Charlie, Darren, John, and then me. So that was I felt like pretty cool. It was a cool uh, a cool setup and cool to just experience the craziness and the amount of I wouldn't even say arguments, but just disagreements. They don't. It's not like they're getting mad at each other, but like they do it in a funny way. And it's just, it is, it's something to behold. <laughs> but uh, that was a fun experience. And then, you know, you know, come to find out Moon, who, who I knew as Phil Sneed at the time, but you know, he, he kind of changed his name to Moon. And so I'm like, oh yeah, you, you know, okay. So all these new people, but he had played bass for Goldfinger before I was even playing bass for Goldfinger, uh, Moon. And so Moon came in and then moved over to guitar. I was on bass and we got that kind of really solid and that, that we did a bunch of tours with that lineup. And then we would have, uh, you know, guest, guest members come on in and Chris Chaney from the Living Inn over in Australia toured with us because Phil couldn't make that tour. 
Um, you know, so Goldfinger is kind of, it's a fun party and, and it's not always so important, you know, who's playing exactly what. Uh, obviously, it's, it's always important that John's there. Um, but yeah, I didn't know John that well before I joined Goldfinger. Now, now, of course, I know him very well. We hang out, we, we uh, you know, he calls me on the phone, I call him on the phone, we'll talk for a minute, talk for a while sometimes. Just depends on what's going on. Usually he's pretty busy, or I'm pretty busy, but um, when it, you know, we get along, we have a good time, we go to breakfast together, we'll, uh, he, he, John is very, he's the nicest guy, he's super social, really cool. Um, but uh, we, you know, like in Australia, that first tour, I would like ride with them to a show and it'd be like a couple hours. Um, and I'd be with his family and his mom would be in the van. And it was, it was cool, you know, it was just, just like hanging out, you know, hanging out with anybody, you know, hanging out with a cool family. So uh, uh, his wife is awesome, you know, she'll show up at shows, you know, obviously in LA, but she'll co she's from Jersey, so she'll come out to the shows in Jersey. And uh, she's done that a couple times. I fell off the stage one time at uh, Star, Star, Starland Theater, I think it is, in, in New Jersey and um, excuse me that that hurt but it also was the funniest thing ever and so we went back she still remembers that because she watched the whole thing happen I fell off the stage into in, in, in between the monitor board and the stage there was all these cables like almost like a like a net of cables and I got caught in that net while I was still playing but it was on the last song and so I'm playing 99 Red Balloons, dun, 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 trying to get out of this thing. And there's like people grabbing me and it, and it ripped my pants. My pants have a, um, I still have that, those pants, but I, I ended up putting a, a Real Big Fish patch over the hole in my pants because we were touring with Real Big Fish on that run. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of good memories, I guess, from that, that uh, gold, those early Goldfinger runs. I mean, but they've continued to be amazing. I mean, just, just, you know, the later Goldfinger stuff that we've done, um, Back to the Beach Fest, you know, a bunch of different tour dates that we've done, St. Louis, and, uh, you know, we we had we were having a blast. So we'll get back to it at some point, I'm sure. Uh, you know, there's FOMO going on in the camp. They want to get back and, and play, but but there's just, it's just not that easy. You know, there's a lot of factors, and, and of course, um, we'll see how it goes with MXPX, because MXPX is going to get really busy coming up next year and uh, I hope it doesn't conflict too much with uh, with Goldfinger but I mean but I got to prioritize something so so usually that's MXPX and then Goldfinger is something I do when I can and if I can but I do love it I do enjoy it and I love all the guys hmm. so let's get to the next question hopefully that that's, that's probably more than an answer than you were expecting uh, so, yeah, let's get to the next question. Hey, Mike, this is Cyrus. Um, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of MXPX. Um, you know, before everything and after that album is probably in my top five uh, albums of all time. I really love that one. Um, a lot of great songs on it. Um, and, of course, you guys have, like, other amazing albums, too. Um, but that one specifically is uh, such a meaningful album to me. Um um, so I was just curious, uh, one, um, would you guys ever have any intentions on playing the songs, um, like King of Ho Kings of Hollywood or like On the Ass, any of those, like in any upcoming shows, because I would love to see those live sometime. Um, and another one I was wondering um, is, uh, I noticed like in like the before and after tracks um, on that album, you guys obviously do like the cool like snippets of like songs on that album. Um, but I noticed that the song Family Affair is in those tracks. However, obviously, it's not on the actual album. Um, I believe it's a Chinese bonus track. Um, so I was just curious, is there, like, is there any uh, reason why that was left off the album and only has a bonus track? Because um, I think that track is a really good one, but I was kind of wondering that. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for rocking out. You guys are the best, and I uh, hope to hear back from you. See ya. Cool. Hey, thanks, Cyrus. Um, Man, thanks for loving before everything, uh, before everything and after. It's uh, it's a a timepiece for us. You know, it was a time of our lives where it was unlike anything else. We were becoming adults. We were, you know, we were. Everything was changing in the world, and and you know, I, and to be honest, I was 
going from a rambunctious, I'm still rambunctious, never mind. Uh, I don't know what I was going to say, but uh, let me just answer your questions. Let me answer your questions. So will we play anything off of that, like Kings of Hollywood, On the Outs? Good news is we've played On the Outs recently. We did it on one of our live streams uh, over the summer. Um, between, uh, the live stream is called Between This World and the Next. Uh, I know, it's all these phrases, these catchy phrases. Um, and we did it. And so uh, you probably missed that, but maybe it turned out all right and we will put it up on YouTube at some point. Every Monday, MXPX releases a new YouTube track from our live streams and that one hasn't been posted yet. Or maybe it has, I don't remember. I don't think it has. So stay tuned for it. But um, that means, you know, the fact that we did it and it went, it was good. I, I enjoyed doing it. I think we could do it live so, at some point. Um, Kings of Hollywood, honestly, I think the reason why we don't do it is because one, Tom does not like that song. He doesn't like the guitar part. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was just an experiment song, honestly. That was something that, that nowadays we probably wouldn't have put on that record. We would have, it would have been slowly going the way of Family Affair, which uh, I'll answer that as well. Uh, the reason why that's not on the record, Family Affair, is because we felt like it wasn't quite finished. It was like, okay, it was close. There's just something about it that's not quite right. And so we left it off the album. And so that's why I ended up releasing the demo version, acoustic version, and changing the name to Sweet Sweet Thing. Changed up the lyrics a little bit. But, uh, What's up, Mike? Oh, <laughs> that was still playing. Uh, that's the next, the next voicemail. Uh, but um, the, there was just something about it that we just didn't, we just didn't think was finished about Family Affair. So that's why it's not on the record, but it is on those snippets. Cause we're like, yeah, it doesn't really matter if it's on that snippet. It's kind of cool. We, we thought that'll be kind of cool cause people won't know where that is, what that is, where it came from, cause it's not anywhere on the record. And that to us was appealing. It, you know, let's confuse people. All right, cool. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like, there's a lot of other songs we do play um, on that record. Um, trying to think of one. Every now and again, we still play Well Adjusted. We'll throw that out. Um, we'll play Play It Loud. I mean, that's that's definitely a, a fan favorite. People love that song, and it's a band favorite. The band loves to play that as well. So, um, yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe you know, you might miss On The Outs live if, we, if you're only seeing one show. <laughs> but... Uh, so out of 10 live streams, we played on the outs once. So just to give you an idea, we have a lot of songs. <laughs> we played over a hundred songs, I think. If I, if I, if I, I, I may be wrong, but I think we played over a hundred songs altogether uh, on those, those live streams. All right, let's m get to one last voicemail and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys. What's up, Mike? This is Suge calling from Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we miss you down here, buddy. Uh, I had a question, man. The um, Salt Lake City. Maybe you already talked about it, but that jam. What's the What's the story behind it? Why don't you want to go back to Salt Lake City? Um, can't wait to hear back from you, bro. Keep making new music. It's all fucking rad. All the new stuff. So, appreciate you, brother. Bye. Rad. Thanks for calling in, Shug. Hope Texas is treating you well down there. Um, so. Salt Lake City, that's a great story. We, we had a, a, you know, we were gonna do a sh two shows in Salt Lake City with Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and Slick Shoes, and they got canceled due to COVID. But we released that cover song for those shows because we wanted to do them live with Bad Cop, Bad Cop because we got Stacey D and Jenny Cottrell uh, from, Cotterell, sorry, uh, from Bad Cop, Bad Cop to sing on the song. And the song is a cover, it's a dwarf song and I called up Blag, asked him if we could do it. He gave us the blessing. Um, so the story behind the song is just, it's a funny song. It's like, I'm not going to Salt Lake City. It's just, it's a joke. It's, it's meant to be like tongue in cheek because we're actually coming to Salt Lake City because we had shows. So that's the whole joke is, is promoting a show 
two shows in Salt Lake City with a song about not I'm um, not going to Salt Lake City. So, um, <laughs> and the whole, you know, the story behind that song is just, I, Black, I had Black on the podcast and he talks all about how he wrote that song and, and how he came up with it. But um, yeah, we, we did it for fun and because we like to do crazy things. And uh, having Bad Cop, Bad Cop singing on the song made it so much better and so much cooler. And uh, we love doing those things. So more to come, of course. Uh, but uh, that's, that's Salt Lake City right there. We will come back someday. We will. And we'll definitely come back to Texas someday and everywhere else we can, you know we will. All right, you guys, uh, I'm getting tired. Let's, let's move on with our day. Thank you so much for listening. I'm not actually getting tired, I'm kidding. Uh, but we are gonna be done. Uh, that's it for your voicemails. Thank you so much for calling in. Please, if you wanna be part of the podcast, you wanna be on the next voicemail episode, call in 360-830-6660. Leave me a voicemail and let me know what's up. All right. Peace out.